Today we're going to look at uh, lab number eight, uh, flip-flops. Uh, we're going to be using some basic gates, so the 7400. We're going to be using a uh, 7474, a dual D flip-flop. And you'll notice the textbook change. Instead of using a obsolete uh, 7476, we're going to be using the 74112. We're going to be working from Chapter 9 of your textbook, uh, Flip Flop and Other Multivibrators. I've broken the labs down into uh, two parts, so we've got one lab for flip flops and a second lab for multivibrators. The flip flops are fairly complex to understand, so I highly recommend you read your textbook on these uh, devices. So figure 9-1 gives you the logic symbol for the uh, basic RS flip-flop. Uh, basically we have a set input and a reset input and you'll notice that they have bubbles on the input which means that the inputs are active low. So if you want to set the device you put a logic 0 on the set. The outputs are Q and Q0 the Q0 is just the opposite of the Q, so if the Q is a logic 1, the Q0 will be a logic 0. Uh, Q stands for quasi-stable. Uh, we're going to be getting into clocked or edge-triggered flip-flops, and the output is no longer contingent on what you set your inputs at, because when a clock signal comes along, your outputs could change. So we use the letter Q for quasi-stable. So figure 9-2 shows the uh, RS flip-flop using uh, NAND gates. And that's the circuit we're going to wire up. And figure 9-2 also gives us the truth table for a uh, reset set uh, flip-flop. Uh, you'll notice that we have conditions here. So for our set and our reset, 0 is active, 1 is inactive. So if you try to set it and reset it at the same time, that's not a normal condition. So we don't try and set and reset at the same time, so they call it a prohibited operation. So if you wanted to set your flip-flop, you'd have the set line go to 0, your reset line at 1, giving you a Q output of 1, indicating that it's set, and the Q naught would be the opposite. Same thing with the reset. For the reset to be active, we put a 0 on the reset line, which means Q goes to 0, or it's reset, and Q naught would be 1. And when we have both our set and reset set at 1, there's no change on the output. So if the previous output was 0 and 1, then the no change is still 0 and 1. So this is the schematic from your lab. Uh, this is uh, lab schematic, part A, R, S, uh, flip-flop. Uh, you'll notice on here I've put the pin numbers down, and you should by now know what the pin numbers are for the 7400. So you can see that the RS flip-flop is rather hard to analyze. The reason being the output from the first NAND gate feeds the input of the second NAND gate, and the output of the second NAND gate feeds the input of the first NAND gate. So it makes these very hard to analyze. You have to kind of assume what an output's going to be and then work backwards on it. So if we were to take the first condition where we want to set this. So to set this we put a logic 0 on the set line and a logic 1 on the reset line. Now it's very important you understand the truth table for a NAND gate. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And the output would be when you have both inputs 1, the output is 0. 
So for all other conditions, the output will be 1. So if I'm putting a 0 in, you can see that the output of the first NAND gate is going to be a 1. So this output is a 1. The 1 feeds back into our second NAND gate. So 1, 1 on the NAND gate, 1, 1 gives us 0 on the output. So it makes analyzing these fairly tricky when the outputs feed the back into the inputs. So I'll let you play with the rest of those on the truth table. So this is my circuit already set up and running. So I'm going to use my first switch for set, my second switch for reset. The red LED is going to be my Q, and the green LED is going to be the Q0. Now you'll notice where the set and the reset are both 1, my Q is outputting a logic 0 and the Q0 is a logic 1. So if I move my set switch to logic 0, you'll notice my Q light is on. So that's a logic 1. Q0 is 0. Then I move my set switch back to logic 1. And you notice the Q is still 1 and the Q0 is still 0. So I'm now I'm going to activate my reset switch. The reset switch is active low. So when it goes low, you'll notice that the Q output is now 0 and the Q0 is now 1. So when I move my reset switch back to a logic 1, you'll notice that my Q is still logic 0, my Q0 is still logic 1. The prohibited condition where I have the set and the reset active. You'll notice both my Q and my Q0 are logic 1. So back on my truth table here, when the set was active, my Q was a logic 1, my Q0 was a logic 0. When my reset was active, my Q was a logic 0, and my Q0 was a logic 1. When both my set and my reset were 1, they weren't active, so there was no change in here. So from my previous case, if there was no change, that would be 0 and 1. When both my set and my reset were both active, Q was 1 and Q0 was 1. So checking back with my textbook, you can see where both set and reset were both 1, there was no change on the output. Once you've wired up your circuit for procedure part A, and verified that it is working, demonstrate it to your instructor so that they can initial it to indicate that it is complete. Part B of the lab talks about the clocked reset set flip-flop. Section 9-3 of your textbook talks about the clocked reset set flip-flop. I want you to notice in your textbook that it says the basic RS latch is an asynchronous device. Asynchronous 
means that does not operate with a clock or any kind of timing device. The clocked RS flip-flop adds a valuable synchronous feature to the RS latch. Figure 9-4 gives you the logic symbol for the clocked reset set flip-flop. You'll notice there's a set input, a reset input, and there's now something called a clocked input. There's still a Q and a Q naught on the output. Now I don't know if you noticed or not, but you'll notice the set and the reset and the clock, they don't have bubbles on them. So when are they going to be active? They're going to be active when they're high. So figure 9-5 part A shows us what the clocked RS flip-flop is going to look like and this is what we're going to wire up in our circuit. You'll notice that we're using the clock to allow the two inputs to feed through to our basic reset set flip-flop or our RS flip-flop. So also in figure 9-5 they've given us the truth table in uh, part B here. Um, we have our mode of operation, hold, set, prohibited. We have our standard uh, set and our standard reset. But you'll notice now we're going to introduce this clock signal. And we need the positive clock pulse in order to make a change on the output. Now I've put the PID numbers down for my IC. Uh, you'll notice we're using four gates, but they're all NAND gates. So as before, this is U1A, so this is still pins 1, 2, and 3. And this is U1B, so this is 4, 5, and 6. So I don't need to change any of the wiring in here, but I do need to add U1C and U1B. And those are going to be on pins 8, 9, and 10, 11, 12, and 13. So you'll notice that when you look at this truth table, when the set is logic 1, and the reset is logic 0, the Q is set. So these are now active high instead of active low. So this is part B, the clocked RS flip-flop, and I've got it all wired up on my board. You'll notice that all my switches are in the down position because the down position is zero and they're not active when they're at zero. My output currently, the Q is a logic one, the Q naught is a logic zero. My switches are set up so that I have the first switch is the clock, the second switch is set, the third switch is reset. This is figure 9-6 of your textbook and we're starting to get into waveform diagrams and this is what starts to make uh, flip-flops a complex subject. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to show you here is just looking at this condition right here where the set line is zero and the reset line is 1. Now we said these were active when they were high. So when the reset goes high, the Q should go low. And you'll notice it waits a little while. What is it waiting for? It's waiting for the clock signal to go high. So when the clock signal goes high and the set is low or inactive, and the reset is high or active, the Q goes low or logic zero. But you'll notice it has to wait for this clock pulse to come along. So the clock has to be high for the set and reset to affect the Q on the output. So back here on my circuit, 
my set switch is low my reset switch is high you'll notice that the outputs don't change until my clock signal goes high once the clock signal goes high you can see that my Q goes low or is reset and my Q naught is high so then we put the clock back to a logic zero So if I put my set switch high and my reset switch low, there's no change until my clock goes high and then low again. When both my set and my reset switches are low and the clock signal comes along, there's no change on the output. With my clock switch low, if both my set is active high and my reset is active high, you notice there's no change on the Q or the Q naught until my clock goes high. You notice when the clock goes high, both my Q and my Q naught are logic one because I'm setting it and resetting it at the same time. So filling in my truth table, when my set was 0, being inactive, and my reset was 1, being active, reset made my Q 0, my Q not a 1. And when set was logic 1, or active, and reset was 0, or inactive, my Q was a logic 1, my Q naught was a logic 0. And when my set is active and my reset is active, my Q was a logic 1, my Q naught was a logic 1. Notice for all of these changes to happen, the clock pulse has to be high. If it's in the low state, there are no changes on the output. And when my set and my reset were both inactive, there was no change on my output. So I'm just going to fill in here and see for no change. Once you've wired your circuit up for part B, and verified it's working, demonstrate it to your instructor so they can initial it to indicate that it is complete. Moving on to part C of our lab, we're going to start working with the D flip-flop. And you'll notice that it's edge triggered. So section 9.4 of your textbook talks about the D flip-flop and you notice we have a logic symbol for the D flip-flop. We have the basic Q and Q naught outputs. We have the D or data input. And we have the clock input. Figure 9.9 of your textbook shows you the logic symbol for the 7474 D flip-flop with asynchronous inputs. Here's the data. Here's the clock. Notice that we have a little triangle symbol for the clock here. This indicates that it's edge triggered. We have the Q, the Q naught outputs, and we have a preset and a clear or a reset. Notice there's a little bubble on them to indicate that they're active low. The data input would be a synchronous input. That means it has to wait for the clock signal to show up on the output. The preset and the clear are asynchronous inputs, meaning they do not need to wait for the clock signal to operate. 
I just want to show you this line in your textbook where it says the asynchronous inputs. The asynchronous inputs are the preset and clear. They override the synchronous inputs on this D flip-flop. So what that statement says is the data that comes in has to wait for the clock to come out on the output. So if you put a 1 on the data line, you're going to get a 1 on the output when we get the positive edge of the clock signal coming along. But if I put the preset line and make it active by going to ground or logic 0, preset is going to put a 1 on the queue immediately. It's not going to wait for the edge of the clock signal before it comes out on the output. Figure 910 gives us the truth table for the 7474D flip-flop. You'll notice that there is a preset and a clear, and if the preset line goes low, the queue is going to go to a logic 1. You notice the clock has an X and the D has an X. The X means we don't care, so it's irrelevant to our circuit. What's important is the preset and the clear lines. So you'll notice they're labeled asynchronous set and asynchronous reset. So when the preset is zero, Q is going to be one. For the reset, when the clear is zero, the Q is going to be zero. We've got X's for the clock, X's for the D. That means these are irrelevant inputs. It doesn't matter what you put on the inputs, the presets and the clears are what's going to come out on the Q and the Q naught. Now when the preset and the clear are both inactive, both logic ones. Now whatever is on the D is going to come out on the Q on the rising edge of your clock waveform. So that's when your clock goes from 0 to logic 1. Then whatever's on the D is going to show up on the Q. And of course the opposite will be on the Q naught. So chapter 9-6 talks about triggering of flip-flops and you can see here this is our clock pulses coming along and we have a positive or leading edge so when it goes from logic 0 to logic 1 and here we have a negative or trailing edge so this is where it goes from logic 1 down to a logic 0 so figure 9-19 is showing you that for a positive edge triggered flip-flop, when the positive edge of the clock signal comes along, the output on the Q changes. So the Q changes right on the positive edge. On a negative edge triggered flip-flop, you'll notice that the Q changes on the negative edge where it goes from logic 1 down to logic 0. So here's my 7474D flip-flop wired into a circuit. I've set up the dip switches so that the first switch is going to be my preset, the second switch will be my clear, the third switch is the clock, and the fourth switch will be my data or D input. The red LED is going to be my Q, my green LED is going to be my Q naught. Remember the preset and the clear are active low. So right now they're in the logic 1 position. So if I move my preset down, you'll notice the Q is now logic 1 and the Q naught is 0.
If I move the second switch, the clear, down, it's now active, and the Q is 0, and the Q0 is 1. If I move the preset and clear down, you notice both the Q and the Q0 are both 1. If I remove the active from the uh, clear line, so if I move it back to a logic 1, you'll notice the preset is presetting my Q and clearing the Q0. And if I move them both back to a logic 1, they're no longer active. My data line is at a logic 1. My clock, I'm going to move to a logic zero. And you'll notice there was no change on the output. I'm going to move my D input to a logic zero. No change on the output. I'm going to move my clock from a logic zero to a logic one, generating that positive going transition. Now the data has changed, and the output is a logic zero. If I change my data, you notice there's no change on the output. To change the output, my clock has to start at a logic zero. I change my data, then I change my clock from a logic zero to a logic one to get that positive going transition then the data shows up on the output. If I change my data to a logic zero, and now I come along and change my clock from a one down to a logic zero, you notice my output changed. It wasn't because it was changing on a negative going transition, it was changing due to switch bounce which I'm going to cover in the next section. With my Q output being a logic one, my data logic one, and the clock being at logic zero, I'm going to use the asynchronous inputs to change the output on the Q. So I'm gonna press the clear, and you notice it's now cleared my Q. I have one on my data line, so I'm going to change the clock from zero to one, giving it that positive transition that it wants. And you'll notice the output doesn't change. D is a synchronous input and waits for the clock signal, but the preset and clear are asynchronous, and they do not rely on the clock signal. So resetting my clock back to zero, taking away the clear line. Now when I change my clock signal from zero to one, the data does show up on the Q output. So to fill in my truth table, when the preset goes low, it's active. So, preset will set my Q to a logic 1, my Q0 to a logic 0. When my clear goes to a logic 0, that's when it's active, my Q will be 0, my Q0 will be 1. When both my preset and my clear are active, both the Q and the Q0 will be logic 1. When both my preset and clear are high, then whatever data goes in and the clock signal goes from a logic 0 to a logic 1, which is the positive going transition, 
the data will show up on the queue. In this case, the 1 will show up on the queue, and the 0 will show up on the queue not. When 0 is on the data line, and the clock transitions from a logic 0 to a logic 1, a 0 will show up on the queue output, and a 1 on the queue not. Once you've wired up your circuit for part C of the lab and verified it's working, demonstrate it to your instructor so that they can initial it to indicate that it is complete. Part D of the lab uses the JK flip-flop. The JK flip-flop is covered in section 9-5 of your textbook. Figure 912 of your textbook gives you the logic symbol for the JK flip-flop. You'll notice we have the Q and the Q naught outputs. In this case, we have a J input and a K input. We have a clock input, and we have that little symbol indicating that it's edge triggered. And there's a little bubble on the input of the clock signal indicating that it is negative edge triggered. That means when it goes from logic 1 down to logic 0. Figure 913 gives you a truth table for the uh, JK flip-flop. Some of the things that I want you to notice in here is that when J and K are both 0, there's no change. When K is a 1, it acts like a clear. So your output is 0, and the Q0, of course, is the 1. When the J is 1, that kind of acts like a set, and you'll notice your Q is a 1. When both J and K are 1, the output is going to be the opposite state once we get this clock signal. So if it was a 1, it's now going to be a 0. If it was a 0, it's now going to be a 1. This is called toggle mode, and it's very useful when we make counters. Figure 917 gives you the uh, logic symbol for the 7476, which is a JK flip-flop. We're going to be using the 112. But I just wanted to show you that this is the J input, this is the K input, and here's the preset and clear. And you'll notice that they are active low. And of course, these are asynchronous inputs. The J and the K are synchronous inputs. Figure 915 in your textbook gives you the entire truth table for the JK flip-flop. You'll notice we have asynchronous inputs which don't wait for the clock signal. And we have synchronous inputs that do wait for the clock signal. So when you're using the asynchronous inputs to change your cue, it doesn't matter what the clock, the J, or the K are doing. But when we're no longer using the asynchronous inputs, then the J and K will trigger on the clock signal. So in this case, we saw it was the negative going transition. So once again, I'm going to reference the TTL data book, volume two, that was sitting on my uh, bookshelf. So this is the page for the 7476 uh, JK flip-flop. Uh, you'll notice that there's two flip-flops in one package. But you'll notice for the 7476, VCC was on pin 5, and ground was over here on pin 13. So this chip has now become obsolete and can no longer be ordered. So this is the 74112, uh, and you can see it's a dual JK negative edge triggered uh, flip-flop with preset and clear just like the 7476, but now you can see that pin 16 is VCC and pin 8 is ground. And this book gives you the internal workings of the uh, 112, and you can see that it's made up from standard logic gates. 
So we have three input AND gates, we have uh, NOR gates, and NAND gates, and you can see here that the outputs feed the inputs just like the uh, RS uh, flip-flops that we just started with. Now that book I just showed you had the uh, pinouts for the uh, 112 and that was for uh, Texas Instruments. Uh, this particular pinout I got from the internet and you can see that the difference is this one shows you the logic symbol for each of those uh, JK flip-flops and it makes wiring up uh, one of these a little more simpler I think. I do want you to notice that for gate number one or a gate we can see the clocks on one, the K's on two, the J's on three, the presets on four, uh, Q's on five, Q naughts on six, but notice this one's labeled 2Q naught and actually goes to the second gate or the second flip flop. If you look up here, you can see pin 15 goes to the clear line of the first flip flop. So remember to use pin 15, not pin 7, when you wire up your JK flip flop. So here's the schematic that I'm going to wire up and please notice that I've put the correct pin numbers down and like I just said the clear line goes to pin 15 not pin 7. I've set up my circuit for part D. I have my 74 LS112 in the circuit. You'll notice the red LED is going to be my Q, the green LED is going to be my Q0. Right now my Q is at 0, my q naught's at 1. I've set up the switches identical to the truth table, so the first switch is going to be the preset. That's the asynchronous preset, followed by the asynchronous clear, followed by the clock. So the third switch over is the clock, followed by the J and then the K switch. So if I move my preset switch to a logic zero, making it active, the Q becomes a logic one. If I move the clear switch to a logic zero, making it active, my Q is zero. If I put the preset and the clear to logic zero, making them active, both my Q and my Q naught are at logic one. Moving the preset and the clear to logic one, they're no longer active. The J and the K are active high. So if I move my J switch to a logic zero and leave the K switch as a logic one, the K switch should act as a clear. If I move the clock switch from a logic one down to a logic zero, it will give the JK flip-flop the negative going transition. Once it receives the negative going transition, the K is clearing my Q. If I move the J to a logic 1 and the K to a logic 0, the J should set my flip-flop. So I'm going to move my clock back to logic 1 and then down to logic 0 to give it the negative going transition and now you can see that my Q is set because J is high and J acts like a set. When both my J and K are logic 1, I move my clock 
to a logic 1 and then down to a logic 0 to give it the negative going transition and you can see the output toggled. I'm going to move the clock back to a logic 1 and then down to a logic 0 and it toggles again. If I keep doing this eventually I'm going to get it to malfunction. There, it just malfunctioned. The reason it malfunctioned was due to something called switch bounce. There, it's malfunctioned again. The LED came on briefly. All that's happened is it's toggled more than one time. And this is due to switch bounce. Once you've wired up your circuit for part D of the lab and verified it is working, Demonstrate it to your instructor so that they can initial it to indicate that it is complete. I talk about switch bounce in your lab and all switches are mechanical devices and because of this they slam metal contacts together causing a bounce. I've managed to capture this on the oscilloscope for you. This is an output of one of our dip switches and you can see that when I go from a logic zero to a logic one, I get a bounce, and then I get another bounce, and then I get a couple more little bounces. It's very hard to determine how many bounces that you're going to get, so we need to build a debounce circuit so that we don't get bouncing on our clock signal. They're showing you a little circuit with an input switch. They have something called a decade counter going to a seven segment display. The problem they're having is every time they press the switch, the count should go up by one, but it's going up by several. This is caused by switch bounce. Continuing on in figure 6-27, you can see that they've made a TTL debounce circuit from a RS flip-flop. So now when you change the inputs on your RS flip-flop, it's going to give a clean clock signal going into your counter. So we're going to build one of these on our circuit. So you can see in part E of our lab, I've incorporated this RS uh, flip-flop to generate our clock signal for us. And you'll notice that I've put down all my pin numbers and this is the only part of the circuit that's new and it's going into pin one of my JK flip-flop so you'll notice as I've wired up each wire I've gone over it with a highlighter to make sure that I have all the wires in the correct locations you'll notice in part E of the lab we have a truth table to fill in uh, we're going to be leaving the preset and clear at logic one so they will not be active uh, the J and K are both going to be logic 1, so the flip-flop will be in what's called toggle mode. So whatever is on the Q when it hits a toggle should change to the opposite of what was on it. So if it was 1, it should become 0. If it is 0, it should become 1 on the next toggle. So the only thing we're changing on this truth table is the clock and we need to get that negative going transition. So this is my circuit that's been modified. You'll notice I put the uh, 7400, the uh, NAND gate, down this end of my circuit because this was already previously wired up. The red light's still my Q. The green light's the Q naught. Down here on my switches, the first switch is still the preset. The second switch is still the clear. The clock line has been disabled. This is still my J and my K. And you notice all my switches are in the up location. To trigger this RS flip-flop, I've set up the two inputs on the last two switches. So the second switch from the end is my set my last switch is the clear you'll notice that they're both high because this guy was active low I've also hooked up an LED on the output 
of my RS flip-flop so that I can tell that it's already in a logic zero position. So if I move my first switch down, you'll notice it's setting my RS flip-flop. So the light's on, so I'm at logic one. So I'm going to move my switch back to logic one, no longer setting it, and now I'm going to move my second switch down, which should clear my RS flip-flop, giving the negative edge to my JK flip-flop. You'll notice my output is now logic zero, so I went from one to zero, and the output came back as a clock signal to my JK flip-flop, and my JK flip-flop went from being clear to being set. So now I'm going to move the clear line back to logic one, I'm going to move the set line down to logic zero, making it active, then back to logic one, and then once again I'm going to use the last switch to clear my RS flip-flop, so it should go from logic one that it's at now to logic zero, and I get a nice clean toggle on my JK flip-flop. So over on my truth table, I'm going to fill in a zero for my Q, a one for my Q naught, and then I got that nice clean toggle come in. So my Q changes to a logic one, the Q naught was a logic zero, and then I get another clean negative going transition coming in. So I change from a one to a zero, and my output becomes a logic one. Once you've wired up part E of your circuit and verified that it is working, demonstrate it to your instructor so that they can initial it to indicate that it is complete. On the last page of the lab, we have 10 questions for you to answer and hand in. If you are looking for answers, open your textbook. Page one of the lab shows some hints, and in this case it's solve problems 6.44 to 6.47 and 9.1 to 9.41.